He is going to move swiftly. Now is the time to hear the voice of the Lord. Wherever you are, wherever this live stream will go, I declare that you will hear the word of God and change our mentality, change our attitude. But our focus has to be on Christ. He is the one that died for us. He's the one that gave his life for us. He's the one that went to the cross of Calvary and paid the price for us. He, he, he took on what we should. God did it for us. In the midst of a hopeless, in the midst of a hopeless situation, in the midst of a helpless situation, God himself did it for us. He himself brought salvation. So the same grace that was existing then is the same grace that is existing now. Jesus is calling. Jesus is saying, come home, my child. I want you to put your trust in the Lord. What's power with a strong focus. Let, let nothing move you or deter you or derail you. And I'm saying to us, if we are going to recover, it means we have to steer the course. And it's only God that will give us the grace as parents, as brothers and sisters in some families to steer the course. to each and everyone. We are so happy and so joyous in our spirit that you can join us tonight for our School of Praise and Bible Study. We are extremely happy for our Guide and Light family who has joined us tonight and for you who have joined us through the Facebook and the YouTube channels. We are even more ecstatic that you can be here tonight with us. We give God thanks and we give God praise for giving us life for giving us breath, for sparing us this day, yes, this 15th day of February 2022. Let's just give God some praise before we go into our prayer and our Bible study. Let's just lift our hands wherever you are. Just give him the praise. Father, we give you glory. Father, we give you honor tonight. Father, we lift your name up high. We exalt you because you are the King of Kings and you are the Lord of Lords. Father, we focus in on you tonight and we put ourselves aside. Father, we exalt you and we say you are the name above all names and there is none like you. We thank you for your providential care today, Lord. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that covers us, oh God, against accidents seen and unseen. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for how you have kept us, you have provided for us, and even down to tonight lord god you keep providing you keep answering our praise and father god we just bless you we just worship you wherever you are in the world today wherever you may have joined us we want you and encourage you to lift the name of jesus up tonight in the name of jesus we thank you we praise you lord we bless you lord we glorify you lord god we say there is none like you above or below, or in the heavens, or under the heavens, there is none like you. And we glorify your name tonight. Hallelujah. We honor you, Father God, and we bless your name. Hallelujah. It is a good thing to give God praise. Amen. 
it is a good thing. The word of God says that praise is comely to the upright. Hallelujah. He has borne our verb praise in the upright. And we have a privilege to give God all the glory and all the honor tonight. Tonight, we are going to go into our time of intercession. We are going to be asking our prophetess Arlene Paris to lead us in a time of intercession and prayer. God bless you, prophetess. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I greet you tonight in the name of Jesus, everyone who have joined us. And tonight we approach the throne of grace. We approach in faith. As you agree with me as we approach tonight. Father, we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. Lord, we proclaim you now and your mighty power and your awesome majesty. Lord, come upon us now and release your power and let your presence flow. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, for we know you are the only wise God. You are the true and the living God. You are the ever-living one. And because you are alive and well, and because your ears are open unto our cry, because you are the God that hears and answers prayer, we come boldly now in the name of Jesus. We come through the precious and living blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. We thank you, O Lord, for that coverage, that cleansing, and that protection even now as we approach your holy throne. Father, we want to thank you for this is the day that you have made. The word of God said we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we are thankful that you spared our life to see this day. And oh Lord, this very hour as we are in our school of prayer, Father, we bring all our God, even our needs and petitions before you. And most of all, we want to thank you, oh Lord God, for this opportunity where your word could be sh shared all over the world wherever this broadcast will go tonight wherever this live stream will go father we pray for the hearers and the viewers uh, we pray mighty god by your holy power you will uh, quicken their hearts uh, you will quicken their ears uh, you'll open the eyes of their understanding that they will understand what the will of the lord is uh, what he is saying uh, what he requires uh, and what the response should be as your word comes forth. In the name of Jesus, we lift our brother Ronaldo before you. Father, cover him another time. Strengthen him another time. Anoint him for service, Lord God. You said out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. And tonight we declare, Lord God, that it will flow rivers of living water will flow from him. The words that come out of his mouth Oh, for Lord, will come. Oh, mighty God, bring in life, bring in hope, bring in healing, bring in health and deliverance. Pick on your man's servant another time. And Father, we will not fail to give you all the glory and the honor and the praise that is due to your name. Now, Lord God, we lift our school children. In Barbados, we lift all over the world the children. But right now, Lord God, we focus in on on the children in Barbados uh, who are about to go back into school face to face. Uh, Father, you know all things. Uh, you know the season that we are in. Uh, you knew this would come before we ever imagined anything like this. Uh, and because you are the all-knowing God, uh, and Father, because you care for children, uh, for you said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for us. This is the kingdom of heaven. Because we know you care for children, we lift them up before you at this very hour. Father, everyone, every boy, every girl, every teenager, we lift before you. In the name of Jesus, we plead your blood from the north to the south to the east to the west of the children in this island, Father, in the name of Jesus. We pray that you, O oh Lord God, will overshadow them. We pray, mighty God, that you lead and guide them. We pray you'll protect them, O oh Lord God, by your divine power. You know all that it entails, O oh Lord, for this face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, Father, there are so many things that we can imagine in our minds uh, that could happen. But because we know that you are a God that keeps covenant, uh, 
We believe that you're the God that will protect our children. And so as we bring them to you tonight, Lord, I pray you'll hover, hover them even as a, a hen hovers her chicks under her wings. I pray you'll hover the children of this island in the mighty name of Jesus under your precious wings. I pray for your divine protection. I pray for wisdom and understanding. I pray, mighty God, that you will cause them to be obedient. You will cause them to be submissive, even to the very protocols and all that they have to do. Mighty God, to go back in this face to face. Father, you see and you know what could happen. We are also aware. But we know, oh Lord God, that things must go on. We know what is happening when they're out. Some children are being guided and helped, and some has no help. They need to be back face to face. But Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray you'll take over, Lord God, by your divine power. I pray you'll take over for each child, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord God, that you'll send help even your ministry angels to assist these children as they go back face to face. We lift the teachers, the principals, the almighty God, the auxiliary staff of every school. Even now I pray in the name of Jesus, you'll grant them the strength, the wisdom and the understanding that they need to do all that they have to do. Father, this might be a challenging time for everyone, but Lord, I pray for grace, I pray for strength, I pray for wisdom, I pray for understanding. I pray, Lord God, that you will send help in the mighty name of Jesus. Even for those, oh Lord God, that might be, um, it might be challenging to handle those who are not online and they might be so far behind those who are online. Father, we ask you to intervene, Lord. Oh, Spirit of the living God, intervene. Father, we ask you to help our children. Father, we ask you to help our principals. Father, we ask you to help our teachers. Father, we ask you to help the auxiliary staff. Almighty God, intervene for us in this time and in this season. Father, you know the future, Lord God. The education that these children have to get will determine their future. And Lord God, we know and we declare tonight that this generation will not be lost in their education, but Lord, somehow you'll intervene and they'll be able to come up to the requirements. They'll be able to come up to scratch and do all that they have to do that will make their future bright in the name of Jesus. So Spirit of the living God, as we commit this in your hand, we ask you to shift things. We ask you to intervene. We ask you to put things in place. We ask you to counteract uh, every negative thing that will come against the face-to-face -face education for these children. And in the end, we'll not fail to give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise. Uh, supply every need, Lord. Uh, even the school clothes and all the stationery and all that is needed. Uh, we thank you for providing for them. Uh, we thank you for making a way where it seems to be no way. We thank you, Almighty God, because you are our God. We declare you to be our God. You are not just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you are the God of Barbados. And we proclaim you now. You are the God of this nation. You are the God, oh Lord God, of, of those who have gone before in Barbados. And you are our God now, and you will be our God and our guide forever. So, Father, we ask you to lead and guide and direct uh, even in this time and this season uh, and we give you thanks and praise for answering uh. father i pray that as this uh, this school of prayer goes forward tonight uh, you will continue to get all the glory and all the honor and the praise that is due to your holy name uh, and we say thank you mighty god uh, we praise you we glorify you uh, for we exalt your holy name uh, for our hearing uh, and that's during our prayer tonight, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.
Thank you, Jesus. Over to our brother Ronaldo. God bless you. Hallelujah. Him. Hallelujah. Jesus Amen. Name. We thank you, Lord. We glorify you. I just joined with my sister there, our prophetess, and we continue in that vein of glorifying the Lord. Hallelujah. We bless his name because we believe that when we pray, that our God hears and he answers our prayers. So because we believe, we are already calling it done tonight in the name of Jesus. And we are giving him thanks and we are giving him praise. Hallelujah. We thank our prophetess Arlene Paris for so ably interceding on the behalf of the children of Barbados and also interceding on behalf by extension of the nation. Hallelujah. We give God thanks for her. And at this time, we want to move into our Bible study tonight. And for most of you, if you have not known, uh, but we are doing a series on the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. And last week, I would have commenced this season or this, this um, sorry, I would have commenced this season of the fruit of the Spirit with one, the first fruit of the Spirit, which is love. Love. And love is such a dynamic top topic. It is such a, a, a deep, or it's, it has a lot of depth in it. And I had to take care of that particular topic by itself. But tonight, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we want to look at the second of the nine fruit of the Spirit that is listed in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And that will be our theme, our, our main text going on in this series, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22. We want to look at joy. We want to look at, yes, joy, J-O-Y. So joy, what is joy? Is it a feeling of euphoria caused by a pleasurable event? What does the Apostle Paul mean when he speaks of joy in the context of it being the fruit or a fruit of the spirit. Joy is defined by the Holman's Dictionary, illustrated, sorry, Holman's Illustrated Dictionary as the state of delight and well-being that results from knowing and serving God. I repeat that again. Joy is defined by the Holman's Illustrated Bible Dictionary as the state of delight and well-being that results from knowing and serving God. The definition therefore leads us to conclude that joy spoken of here in this text is conditional or is dependent on one's relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and by extension, the Holy Spirit. Knowing or having that intimate relationship with God through his word and through fellowshipping and obeying him and serving God results in joy. So let me just break that down for you in layman terms. Joy is dependent on our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you would have noted that I did not mention the word happiness. I did not mention the word um, in the definition of, of being happy or, or even being ecstatic because joy is not dependent on happenings or being happy or events. And I just want to reiterate or to reinforce this point because in Holman's, in the Holman's Dictionary, it states that joy is the fruit or the manifestation of a right relationship with God. The commentators of Homer goes on to state, joy is the Christian life in direct proportion as believers walk with the Lord. So I think we're getting a picture here that joy has nothing to do with events. It has all to do with our relationship with the Lord. So the commentators go on to state that those who have the joy and that's the joy of the Lord, they can rejoice because they are in the Lord and not just in the Lord, they have a relationship with the Lord. You would have noticed, as I said, I have not mentioned happiness, I have not mentioned the word pleasure, 
but I just mentioned the word relationship. And I want us to hold to that term, relationship, because it's going to come up quite a few times as we go on in tonight's study. So, you see, brothers and sisters, this joy that Paul speaks about is a long-lasting joy that is sustained by the Lord, by our relationship, and is not conditional on whether we feel happy or not. This is why even when we will go through hard times, we will go through our trials, we will go through troubles, persecution, we still have that joy because that joy, the source of that joy is in the Lord via the Holy Spirit. The word joy also is found 149 times throughout the Bible. Yes, believe it or not, 149 times throughout the Bible. And this is according to the Holman's Illustrated Bible um, Dictionary. Sorry. Let's look at a few scriptures just to validate, and I'll not exhaust this part of the study because I want to go into other salient points about joy. But let's just take a look in the scriptures to see where joy is mentioned. Psalms 30, verse 5. Psalms 30, verse 5. The psalmist or King David states that for his God's anger endureth but for a moment in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy or singing or rejoicing comes in the morning or in the daybreak. So we can clearly see here in Psalms 30 verse 5 that the psalmist David states that God's anger is but for a moment. And weeping, we know in life, we have times of pain, we have times of trials, and weeping, yes, we will sorrow for a time. But joy, thank God tonight, comes in the morning. And that joy coming in the morning doesn't necessarily speak of a morning event. But in the words of Israel, Hotem, which I agree with, joy comes when we wake up. And when we spiritually wake up and know that this joy is within the Holy Spirit and we have this joy whether any event or anything comes our way. Here we see that, yes, there are times of sorrow, as I said, there are times of pain. But King David reiterates that our joy comes in the morning. I even go to King Solomon that states, there is a time and a season for everything under the sun. Yes, there is a time to sorrow. And we know the scripture very well in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There is a time to sorrow. There is a time to weep. There is a time to talk and there is a time not to talk. But there is also a time for us to engage in joyous events and have joy within our hearts. Joy is also known as a shout or a shout of joy or singing or rejoicing. As the Hebrew derivative of the word states, joy or awakening of joy comes alive in an individual. In this case, joy refers to singing. Just as we reference the Psalms 30 verse 5, the joy that we speak of there we, we, it refers to a singing or a rejoicing or a shout of joy. Let's look at another portion of scripture, a very familiar portion of scripture, Nehemiah chapter 8, and we're going to go to verse 10. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Then he, Nehemiah, said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of 
our God, our Lord, is your strength. Hallelujah. Whose joy is our strength? It is the Lord's joy within us that is our strength. It is our strength to keep us going even in life's most difficult times. The joy of the Lord, not the world's happiness or its event, is our abiding strength. Saints, it is so important that we grasp the understanding of this joy. Jesus himself reiterates while he was on earth, to his disciples and to us by extension, that he desires that this joy remain in us. Yes, he desires that this joy remains in us, in our hearts, and by extension, because this joy remains in us, that our joy may be full. You may be asking, brother, how, how do I know that? How do we know that Jesus wants us to have this joy in our hearts? Are in our lives. We read in the gospel according to St. John chapter 15, verse 11. St. John chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus states, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. You there meaning us. You then there meaning the disciples. It goes on to say, and that your joy might be full. I thank God tonight that Jesus took the time to tell us and to, and to have that desire for us to have his joy in us. But before we can go even deeper into the meaning of this verse, I want us to just to go back to the previous verses in chapter 15. Just for us to get an understanding, because in verse 11, Jesus says, says, these things have I spoken to you. And it begs us to, to ponder, what are these things that Jesus would have spoken to the disciples and to, by extension, he would have conveyed to us tonight. In the previous verses, Jesus would have explained to his disciples the importance of staying in the vine. We know very well in verse 1, um, this, this, this chapter starts, and in verse 2 and in verse 3, it starts with the message of abiding in the vine. Jesus gives an example of the vine. He gives an example of the dresser, which is God, the wine dresser. And he gives an example of us staying in the vine, us being the branches. And we know this very, very, very well, that Jesus is stating here that unless we abide in him, who is the vine, then we can do nothing. He, Jesus, would have conveyed to us in this chapter also, and to the disciples, that if we took it on ourselves to refuse to abide in the vine, then the result is similar to a withered branch that bore no fruit at all, and men gathered and threw into the fire for burning. In addition, Jesus continued to explain the benefits of a relationship or abiding with him, as we see, see in verse 7 of chapter 15. He also expresses the Father, that the Father is glorified when we produce spiritual fruit. Verse 9 and 10 tells us Jesus shares with us the importance of keeping his commandments. And as a result of keeping his commandments, we abide in his love. So these are the things that Jesus previously, before we got to verse 11 of chapter 15 of St. John, these are the things Jesus would have spoken to his disciples. So why, why, why are those things important, you may ask? It is important for us to know what Jesus would have said previous to his statement in verse 11, because unless we abide in the vine, unless we bear fruit, unless we stay in that relationship with Christ, 
we cannot then claim to say that Jesus' joy remains in us. Because this joy, or the source of this joy, is in Christ. I hope you understand that tonight. And it's not in any worldly event. It is not in the halftime NFL, which everyone may have been talking about over the last 24 hours. No, it is not in the things of this world, but our joy is in Jesus and Jesus alone. Our joy is manifested through us by the Holy Spirit, and it remains in us once we are in right or intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus. This intimate abiding relationship in Christ allows us to have not just joy, but a joy that is full. And you will see that in the latter verse, um, the latter clause, sorry, of verse 11. Yes, it is a joy that needs, that does not need, sorry, any addition to it. The Amplified Version also states of this verse, verse 11, that in this manner, that this joy that we have is a joy that delights us. It says, I have told you there things so that my joy and delight will be in you and that your joy may be full and complete and overflowing. So that's the amplified version of verse 11. It uses words such as delight, overflowing, and be complete. That is the Father's desire through the Son to us tonight, that our joy will be full. Hallelujah. Somebody out there, needs this joy tonight and jesus wants to give us this joy jesus wants his joy in us and because his joy is in us he wants it to be full brothers and sisters don't we want to manifest this joy in our lives the holy spirit yes the spirit of jesus christ is in us and lives in us he wants us to experience this joy it is all comes from the source, which is the Holy Spirit. However, we must manifest this joy. And you may say, well, how, how can I manifest this joy? How is this feeling that I have inside manifested in my actions? You may even ponder as the wanting to know what really is this joy that I'm feeling inside? How is it exhibited among my brethren or my sisters? The Apostle Paul says in Romans 14, verse 17. Romans 14, verse 17. He stated, For the kingdom of God is not in meat, nor it is not in drink, but it is in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, I just, as I just stated before, you may be wondering, so how do I exhibit this joy? This joy that we speak of is already in us through the Holy Spirit and is exhibited in our attitudes. Why did I pinpoint this scripture? Because this scripture speaks of an attitude that we must have as kingdom citizens. It speaks to us to state that this joy that we have or the kingdom of God that is within us is not meat, nor is it drink, but it is righteousness and it is peace and it is joy in the Holy Ghost. And underline the part that says in the Holy Ghost, because that is so important for the believer to understand that this joy is not birthed in anything else, but it is in the Holy Ghost and it is exhibited in our attitude. One songwriter could say that this joy is unspeakable and it is full of glory. Another songwriter would say there's beauty in my brokenness and I have joy. I have joy instead of mourning. Yes, this joy, as I said before, is in the Holy Spirit and it is 
the fullness that is within in, in, it, in itself. It is not in the flesh, nor is it in the world. Our joy is in the Holy Spirit. Our joy is in knowing and believing joy. This joy came directly from the source, the Father, the Holy Spirit. And it is within us to be exhibited through us in our attitudes, in our mannerisms, in our actions. So don't, don't get confused and think because I'm going through a trial, I'm going through persecution, I'm going through the hardships of life, the darkest part of my life. Don't be confused tonight and think that your joy is gone. No, my friend. It hasn't gone anywhere. That joy, which is birthed by the Holy Spirit, is within you. That joy is the joy that is the strength that the Lord is giving you. It says the joy of the Lord is your strength. I pray tonight that you will understand that the joy of the Lord is your abiding strength. That strength that, that allows you to go through the toughest times of life. That joy that keeps you sane despite the storms of life. That joy that counteracts depression when you hear that news that your wife or your family member is sick in hospital. It is that joy that keeps you giving God praise, giving God thanks, despite the hardship that you are going through. So, brothers and sisters tonight, let this fruit or this manifestation of the spirit be in us and outwardly manifested in our attitudes and in our demeanor. I go on tonight to the third listed fruit of the spirit. And that fruit of the spirit is peace. P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace. It is often said that peace is the absence of war or conflict. A state of tranquility where difficulties and the trials of life seem to evade our reality. It is mostly portrayed from a worldview to us that peace is found in isolation. And many of us would, you know, have that that picture in our mind we see on the television and the media, you know, persons go on a beach and they're on vacation and it looks so serene. There seems to not be a trouble in the world and they're just relaxing there in isolation. And that is the worldview of peace. Yes, many have this paradigm or this thinking when it comes to understanding what peace really means. But is this really peace? Is this the peace the Apostle Paul refers to here in verse 22? Is it the absence of trials, difficulties only? Is that, is that how we define peace only as an absence of trials or difficulties or hardship? In our modern day reality, brothers and sisters, if we were to adapt or accept that peace is only the absence of conflict, war, or difficulties, then we certainly are not living on this planet we call Earth. And I'll explain. Life in itself is full of tragedies and trials. Just ask Job. Remember, Job was an upright man. Job was a man that feared God. However, Job was not exempted from trials. He was not exempted from difficulties. Job chapter 14, verse 16. Job states in this verse that a man, man that is born of a woman, is of a few days and full of trouble. Yes, my friend. So if you are thinking out there that, okay, I'm in this world and I want peace all the time. 
then think again. Think again tonight, my friend. If Joe, an upright man, a man who feared God, went through one of the most grueling times in his life, and to be honest, anyone looking at Job's story or reading Job's story tonight would say it to themselves, could I have gotten through that? But Job said in verse 60, and, he re and I reiterate, man that is born of a woman is a few days and he is full of trouble. Well, what does that mean? It simply means once you are born in this world, you will have trouble. No one is exempted from trouble. So the point here is life in itself is full of tragedies and trials. And for us to say that peace is defined by an absence of those trials, only by an absence of those trials, are we really truly doing justice to this definition? Are we really understanding what peace is in the context, biblical context? Just look around you today. We have COVID-19. We have rumors of war. We have wars that are being fought. We have famine. We have family conflicts. We have crime on the rise. We have social unrest. And the list goes on and it goes on and it goes on. Peace, the absence of trials, difficulties, no. No, my friend. In this text tonight, peace is not or is not only i should say the absence of conflict and trial the word peace used here by the apostle in verse 22 of chapter 5 of galatians the apostle paul is denote, is denoting the word peace in the greek derivative and that word peace is stated or is known as and i'm going to try to pronounce it well irena Irena, I spelled E I R E N E. Irena, sorry, Irena. That is the Greek derivative of the word peace, which means in this verse, a state of being spiritually whole again. I repeat that for us. The word peace used here by the Apostle Paul is denoted by the Greek word Irena, which means a state of being spiritually whole are spiritually sound again. It is also coined as an inner tranquility amidst life's trials and tribulations. As some Bible versions may convey it, the word peace is an inner peace or an inner tranquility amidst life's storms, against life's difficulties. So according to the Holman's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, the, the author, sorry, according to the Holman's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, the author and professor Ray Sheldon Rand conveys to us, his reader, that the term peace has several meanings in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, according to the context by which the word is being used. First, the author states that outside the Bible, or I saw outside the context of the Bible, the Greek word was likely to mean just the opposite of war. But it is used to translate to the word shalom. And you would hear our apostle reiterate, or he would always end off with his with this word shalom. And this word shalom is used frequently in the Old Testament to mean peace. It is the Greek word for peace. But it is also a word that is coined in the New Testament as well and has been translated in the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint, for those, I'm not going too, too deep with what the Septuagint is, but for those that may want to know, the Septuagint is really a volume, is really a book of translations of the word of God from medieval times straight up to the times of the kings, really, when they died. So the Septuagint it, it, it is, is stating that the word shalom 
of the Old Testament is also translated in the Septuagint and may have been what we would have understand or may have been broadened to be used in the New Testament. So let me just let me just break that down for you, what, what the author is trying to say here. He's trying to say that the word that is used in the Old Testament has been translated to some extent through the Septuagint and broadened in its usage in the New Testament itself. Secondly, the author states that the word shalom could refer not only to the absence absence, sorry, of hostility, strife, or disorder, but also to the condition and sense of being safe and secure. So this word shalom, in the context of the New Testament, if it's translated over in the New Testament, could also mean want to be, have a sense of being safe and secure. The professor goes on to state that the term could also describe a state of either being physical or spiritually well being. Let me just repeat that. The term could also describe a state of either physical or spiritual well being. So we see that peace in its Greek translation has different meanings, whether it be in the Old Testament or whether it be in the New Testament. Peace. Peace in itself had different meanings. But despite these different definitions of the word peace, it is important for the believer, the child of God, to understand and to know these three salient points that we are going to go through tonight. Point number one, who gives us, it's actually a question really, who gives us this peace? And by extension, do we have peace with God? Point number two, what is the purpose of this peace that we are talking about? And last but not least, how are we to exhibit this peace given that it is a fruit of the Spirit? So I'll deal with the first point. Who is the giver of this peace that the Apostle Paul states in verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5. And if you said Jesus, you are totally correct tonight. Yes, Jesus. In the gospel, according to St. John chapter 14, and we go to verse 26, Jesus gives, sorry, in verse 27, Jesus states, that he gives us his peace. So let me just say that again. St. John chapter 14, verse 27, and I'll take my time. Jesus states that he gives us his peace. Let me just read it here for you. According to the King James Version, it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We thank God that Jesus has given us his peace and not the world's peace. But I, I want to just go back to the previous verse, verse 26. And in verse 26, Jesus states to his disciples, but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So, reading this, these two verses, we get the idea, and if you go through in your time, go through chapter 14, you will get even a better understanding that Jesus was speaking to the disciples at the time at a very troubling time for the disciples because Jesus was about to leave. Jesus was about to go back to the Father and he wanted to comfort the disciples at this time. Hence, verse 22 says, but the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you 
all things, and he shall bring things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. But he didn't leave it there. Verse 27, Jesus reassures the disciples and he reassures us that in a troubling world, in a world of chaos, where Jesus physically won't be, but the Holy Spirit will be with us, he goes on in verse 27 and says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as this world gives you peace, but I give you my peace. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So it is very important to understand that although Jesus is physically, yes, he, 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 was, he, was, he died, he resurrected, and he's forever seated at the right hand of the Father, he has not left us comfortless. And by extension, he has not left us in chaos. He has given us his peace, this inner peace within us, which through the Holy Spirit we have within our heart. The comforter, the Holy Spirit, the Father has promised and he has sent, he has given the Holy Spirit to us as not just our comforter, but our peace. Not only does Jesus promise the Holy Spirit will come, but he also gives with the Holy Spirit peace. Jesus in the last ending of the verse, as I said, implies that the world's peace in verse 27 is temporal. Hence he said, my peace I give unto you and not as the world giveth, giveth I unto you. Because let's face it, brothers and sisters, the world today would promise peace as many organizations across the world, they are promising peace, world peace. But we know the reality of this peace is temporal. This peace is not an everlasting peace. This peace does not derive from God. This peace is of the world. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 I'm not going to give you that peace because that peace is not going to last. My peace that I give you will last, despite what you go through, despite the storms of life. My peace will be in you, and my peace will anchor you through life's storms. I thank God tonight for that lasting peace that is within our hearts. It is within our minds, and I'll get to that later. It is within us through the Holy Spirit to keep us in this world today. Who better to give us this peace but Jesus, who is also called the Prince of Peace. And we find that in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It reads, especially the latter part, For unto us a child is born, we know this very well, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, Jesus, meaning Jesus, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. So Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, or the pinnacle, or the ruler, or the giver of peace. That is what Prince of Peace really means. But you may be asking yourself, as I often do question in my mind, how did Jesus wrought such peace for us? How did this peace come about through Jesus? Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It states, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, or our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read that again. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have this peace, peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. So how was this peace wrought? It was through our Lord Jesus Christ. But not just through our Lord Jesus Christ, my friend. It was through the death it was through the burial and the resurrection 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, the atonement for our sin, paved the way for us to have peace with God. I thank God tonight that he sent Jesus because I know and I hope you know that if Jesus did not die for us, he did not pay the price for our sin, the wrath of God would still be on us. And how do I know that? Let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. And it reads, Among whom also we all had our conversations in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were by nature, and note it says we were by nature, not we are by nature. We were by nature the children of wrath, even as others are today. So, this peace wrought through Christ brought us and drew us near to God, but it also allowed us not to have the wrath of God on us. I praise God, as I said, for sending Jesus so that I don't have the wrath on me. Who wants the wrath of God on them? No one does. Because we are reminded of Sodom and Gomorrah and what happened there. It was the wrath, the anger of God that was shown in that instance. So, Ephesians 2 verse 3 says we were the children of wrath. But we are no longer the children of wrath. But tonight, there are some who are not lucky or as blessed as we are to be the children of God. And the hearing of the word wrath, what comes to mind is eternal punishment. What comes to mind is a God that is, is justified to punish us based on our iniquities. And tonight, my friend, listening friend, those who are listening to me, I pray tonight that you choose not to be under God's wrath. And you may be asking yourself, then how do I choose not to be under God's wrath? How do I attain this peace with God? Listening, friend, you don't have to stay in your sinful condition because sin attracts the wrath of God. Yes, sin, as it is alluded here in verse 3, the flesh, the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we would have thought about those in our first, uh, um, in our first section where we talked about love in last week in our Bible study. We would have talked about the flesh. Sin in itself attracts the wrath of God. So tonight, I want you to understand, listening friend, those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, tonight you can have this peace that we are talking about. It is time that you understand and be assured that your sins your pride, your vanity, everything that is within you that is not of God, it is time that you are assured that they can be washed away through the blood of Jesus. Tonight, you can have that inner peace, knowing that God has forgiven you and that you abide in the love of God. Question, my friends, don't you want this peace in your hearts tonight? Isn't it not time to accept the Prince of Peace into your life? He is waiting and he is calling you. He is, the, he is the only one tonight that can give you this peace. Yes, this peace that is talked about in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. And you may say, well, how do... 
I accept the Lord Jesus Christ? How do I attain this peace through the Lord Jesus Christ? My friends tonight, he is only a prayer away. He is only a prayer away. Yes, peace with God through Jesus is only one prayer away tonight. So tonight, I want to, as I'm being led by the Holy Spirit, I want to give that opportunity to our listening audience out there, those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to say this prayer after me. Dear God, I come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. Dear God, I ask that you would wash and cleanse me of my sins, my years of sin and vanity and pride, my years of rebelling against you. I pray, God, that you would wash me in the blood right now. I confess my sins before you. I ask that you will be my Lord and Savior. I ask that you will come into my heart and make me a new creature tonight. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ, he died and he rose from the dead and he forever sits on the right hand of the Father. Accept me into the beloved Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have said that prayer tonight, my friend, you can experience the peace of God. You can know without a shadow of a doubt that your sins are forgiven through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done on the cross. And because he has done it, it is assured that your salvation will not be taken away from you because it is Jesus Christ who has done the finished work. Praise be to God. Tonight we want to move on to our second point. What is the purpose of this peace? Philippians 4 verse 7. Philippians 4 verse 7 states, And the peace of God, yes, the same peace that we're talking about, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I repeat, and the peace of God shall keep your hearts and it shall keep your minds through Christ Jesus. Yes, brothers and sisters, believers in Christ, this peace keeps us or it guards our hearts and minds even in the darkest times of our lives. This peace that even transcends all understanding of trials or the storms of life or difficulties Yes, this peace is within us. The peace of God is able tonight to stabilize, to guard, and to keep our minds in the midst of life's worst trials. In the midst of divorce, it is able to keep. In the midst of loss of a job, this peace is able to keep you. Amidst a loss of, the, of a loved one, the peace of God is able to keep you. Yes, this peace, this peace that resides in us through the Holy Spirit, it is the peace that grounds us and keeps us sane. A prolific author, C.S. Lewis, once said, and I quote, Life with God is not immunity from difficulties, but peace in difficult times. Life with God is not immunity from difficulties, but peace in difficulties. What does that mean? What does he mean? What does C.S. Lewis mean? It means we have God with us. It says life with God is not immunity. It means we are not immune from life's difficulties. Yes, God is with us. And yes, the Holy Spirit is within us. 
But as Job, he was not immune to life's difficulties and trials. We too are not immune to life's difficulties and trials. However, it states, the court states, but peace, we have this peace in difficulties. So it begs us to understand that although we go through in life, we go through hardship, we go through persecution on the job, you may go through trials within your family. You may even go through divorce, a loss of a family member. And the storms of life keep coming in and, and they keep rocking your mind. But this peace is able to ground us up. This peace is able to keep us sane. And I thank God tonight for the peace of God that abides in us as a fruit of the Spirit. It reassures our hearts and minds that no matter what happens in this life, God will never leave us nor forsake us. Yes, my friend, God will always be with us. And because he is with us, this peace, this peace, the peace of God is with us. My prayer tonight, O oh Lord, is let your peace, let it reign within us. Let it reign within your people tonight, Lord. Let it reign within the church. Let this peace bring us through times of persecution, distress. Let our hearts not be afraid, but let us be, ass be assured that the Prince of Peace is with us in life's trials. That leads me into my final point tonight on peace. Given we know and believe that this peace is in us and guards our minds, how do we exhibit this fruit of the Spirit called peace? We exhibit this peace by obeying our calling. And you may say, what calling are you talking about? We are called to be peacemakers. Yes. So how do we exhibit this inner peace that is in us? It doesn't just stay there dormant. Yes, we have the peace of God and, and everything is already us. But we are called to be peacemakers. Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. The gospel according to Matthew, it states in verse 9. I'm just going to put it up here. Blessed are the peacemakers. For there shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the children of God. Yes, we are called to be peacemakers. According to the Homer's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, it defines peacemakers as those who actively work to bring about peace and reconciliation where there is hatred and enmity. Homer's dictionary goes on to state that God blesses peacemakers, as you can clearly see in verse 9 of St. Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. God blesses those who actively go after or bring about peace. He declares them to be his children. Those who work for peace, the whole Roman dictionary states, those who work for peace share in Christ's ministry of bringing peace and reconciliation. I am glad tonight that I am a child of God. I'm not just a child of God, but I am a peacemaker. I believe every child of God out there acquires to be blessed because they are peacemakers. They want to be blessed and they want to be in the same ministry of bringing peace and reconciliation. The Apostle Paul even encourages us believers in Romans 12, verse 18. And we'll go there tonight. Romans 12, verse 18, one eight. Thank you, Jesus. And it reads, 
if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. If it be possible, the Apostle Paul says, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably. Some virgins say, live or be at peace with all men. The Amplified Virgin says, sorry, the American Standard Virgin says, live peaceably or be at peace with all men. Now I know within our world today, yes, there are many persons out there that are assigned, I believe, are assigned from Satan himself to cause strife and to cause hatred among among not the, not only the church but among families and among society. I firmly believe that Satan has his imps. However, we are encouraged by the Apostle Paul to live peaceably with all men. Yes, fellow saints, we have this peace that enables us to live peaceably with all men. So tonight, we will have gone through two of the listed fruit of the Spirit. We will have gone through joy, and we would have gone through peace. And in my short recap, I just want to list the points that we would have gone through because it's very important that after every study, we have points that we can always go back to, whether it's a summarize, is it summarized in, in these points, or we can go through the study itself. We always have points that we can just look through and get the salient points of the study today. So in my short recap, we would have commenced the night's study with the topic, the fruit of the spirit. We would have examined, as I stated, two fruits of the spirit. I know I said fruit and not fruits. Joy and peace. We looked at the biblical definition of the word joy. We understood that joy, true joy, and not happiness is conditional or it is dependent on our walk, our relationship with the Lord. This joy is not dependent on events of pleasure. This joy is not dependent on the world, but this joy is dependent or is sourced within our relationship with the Lord Jesus. And that is why, even as we go through hardship and trials, we can still have joy. We also looked at the frequency in which the word joy was mentioned in the Bible. And we stated that it was mentioned at least 149 times throughout the Bible. Some of the passages of scriptures we would have examined related to joy as well. Last but not least, we examined the we examined, sorry, last but not least, we would have examined joy and what joy we have in our relationship with Christ. An abiding or intimate relationship with Christ gives us joy. After joy, we would have looked and examined peace. We would have defined peace. In terms of a New Testament definition and also an Old Testament definition. We would have looked at three points a believer should know and understand in regards of the fruit of the Spirit called peace. And those points are in order. And I'll just go back there so that you can be clear. Those three points are who gives or who is the giver of this peace? What is the purpose of this peace? And how do we exhibit or how do we manifest peace? Those three points I leave with you tonight that we can sit, we can ponder, we can go through those points and we can assure ourselves that this peace the peace of God 
is within us. The peace of God is not just within us, but it is within us that we manifest it in our daily lives. I hope tonight that you would have gathered what joy and what peace the Apostle Paul would have conveyed in Galatians 5 verse 22. I also pray tonight that we ourselves exhibit both joy and peace in our Christian walk. I thank God for the fruit of the Spirit. And I pray tonight that the fruit of the Spirit of joy and peace will abide in us forever. Even as we conclude tonight's school of prayer and Bible study, I want to pray for the saints. I want to pray for us that we too would have this peace among, uh, amidst, sorry, a troubling, a very chaotic world. Just yesterday, we would have, just last week, we would have heard that rumors of war between Russia and the U.S. over Ukraine. And to some, that may have troubled many in their hearts. But tonight, I say to us saints, don't be afraid. The peace of God is within us. The peace of God will not leave us. And as we trust in God, we will abide in that peace. So if you may bow your heads with me and close your eyes as I breathe a word of prayer for the church in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your joy. We thank you for the peace, the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Father, we thank you tonight that as we abide with you in the vine, in that intimate relationship, Father, we have that peace that despite whatever we may go through tonight and go through in the coming days, you are with us. Your peace is with us. That joy is with us. Father, I pray for the church. I pray for the saints of God who are being persecuted. I pray, oh God, for those who are being targeted for their faith. I pray that you would strengthen them and that the joy of the Lord will be their strength. I pray for those, the saints, who would be in trialing times or in trialing situations where they seem as if you know, everything is going topsy-turvy and, 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 and it's chaotic in this world. I pray that they will hold on to that peace, that everlasting peace. I pray that they will experience that peace that is within them through the Holy Spirit. I pray that that peace that passes all understanding will guard or keep their minds through Christ Jesus. This I pray tonight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. So tonight, as our apostle would say, Shalom. Until next time, God bless you.